spotlighted. <laughs> okay, so um, hello everyone and um, welcoming Penny Slinger, the um, legendary uh, British artist um, who's now living in California and has been for a very long time, who um, is a uh, a pioneer of um, eroticism and mysticism in fine art, I would say, and um, uh, also the queen of collage, <laughs> absolute queen of collage, and slab at slab we do like collage and cut-ups, and um, you've worked in every other medium, painting, sculpture and film, and uh, welcome Penny. Um, Thank you. <laughs> look forward to chatting about your work. So um, I, I'd really like to, I, I'd really like to, to chat about the history of your work actually um, for a little bit because so uh, when I met you, you were living at the Goddess Temple um, in uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains um, that was built for you by your late husband Christopher Hills, um, incredible kind of focus of community. And uh, your focus of your work at the time was the recently completed 64 Dakini Oracle, um, which was a, a form of divination. And um, I, it's actually an interactive thing. And um, actually, you know what, I think that's a really good place to start. Uh, I'm going to put a link for this in the comments. Um, so it's an interactive Oracle of collage. And I, let's send this to everyone. Um, and uh, so it was basically exploring uh, the archetype of, of the divine feminine, of, of the feminine psyche. And you work with lots of different incredible goddesses, um, incredible women in California and, and got them all to embody an archetype, uh, different gods and uh, goddesses and, um, some of which were very traditional and some of which you kind of made up yourself. And uh, this is actually a, um, it's an interactive online thing. So it, it's like a big wheel and you can pick a card um, if anyone wants to go to the link. So it's working with synchronicity and the unconscious as, as a way to um, explore the feminine psyche. So um, I've just put a link to that in the comments. So um, why, why don't we start with like, a, pe people can play with that. Um, you can pick a card. <laughs> and um, now, now, so this is, a, this is like the more recent uh, work, but um, I'd really love to chat to you about the history, um, the, which goes back like about 50 years. Um, are in collage and exploring the, the feminine psyche. Um, and the focus of this workshop um, is the idea of creating an image of your own archetype, a kind of a self-reflection. Um, so if, if people can use themselves as their own muse, um, which is a theme that you've been exploring for 50 years. So, um, yeah, uh, so to give some background um, on Penny, you were inspired by surrealism in the 60s and 70s, um, I, which of course emerged with Freud and Jung, uh, exploring ideas around synchronicity and the unconscious. And um, uh, you were reflecting upon yourself as your own muse. Uh, you attended the Chelsea College of Art in London, uh, 1966 to 69 and wrote a the thesis on the collage books of Max Ernst, um, which inspired your first collage book. So um, yeah, do, do you wanna tell us a little about um, the, the first, your first initial inspiration and what started your, your whole journey? Well, I don't know what started the whole journey because that goes right back to childhood when I was always very inspired to uh, creative expression. Uh, but certainly while I was at art school, I was seeking to find what to do my thesis on. And I, as I looked through the history of art, two things. One, I found that women were evident all through the history of art, and especially the nude woman, but as the muse, not as the actual artist. And 
so that the woman was being seen through the lens often of the male artist because the male artist predominated. And so I felt that there was a big gap there, that this was um, something that needed to come to the fore where one could reflect oneself and show more about who you really are than how you're seen through someone else's eyes. So that's when I embarked upon the idea of using myself as my news and being in two places at once, so to speak. And then when I found the collage books of Max Ernst, that was another revelation for me because uh, up till then I thought collage was just sticking bits of colored paper together and I used to do collage when I was young. But when I saw the collage books of Max Ernst and Simone de Bonte and La Femme Sans Terre, the idea that he'd taken these old engravings and created these seamless works that you couldn't see where they were collapsed. They'd become a new seamless reality. And that to me was so inspiring. So when I did my thesis, I did it on Max Ernst. I went to see Max Ernst in Paris and make sure that I was taking the right approach with what I was writing about him. And then I wanted it to be much more dynamic than just dry, way of producing a thesis with words. And so I made a little animated film using the images from his books and bringing in other live footage and other reference images. And then I also made my own first book of collage, 50% Invisible Woman, which was taking the tools of surrealism, but now using them to try and express the feminine psyche. And it's called 50% Invisible Woman and has on the cover one of those images of the anatomical visible women where you can take pieces off and see the different layers. So I really wanted to do a kind of strip piece that didn't end at the skin, but went right through to explore all the deeper realms of the psyche and the subconscious and to bring that whole picture to life as being who we really are, that other 50% that's not normally seen on the physical level. And fantastic. I actually have, um, I, I've actually got that, that image right here. Um, I, I prepared a little, a little keynote with loads of images from your back catalogue. So maybe while you're talking, um, I can go through this. Shall I just um, share my screen? And um, I can, what do I do? Is it just that? Does that work? Can everyone see this? Okay, um, this is the image. This is the image that you were just talking about, Penny, right? Yes. Um, okay, great. I, yeah, fascinating. So you're kind of like looking inside yourself. Um, I picked a couple of images from that series. Um, I thought I'd start, start with this one and ask you about this one because um, the scissors, <laughs> considering we're into right. using like a cut up technique. So, this one's called um, Cersei. Uh, what was that? This one's okay. called Cersei and um, I'm, I'm showing both the collage artists at work <laughs> and also that kind of, um, yeah, the, the, the fear that men have uh, of the castrating women. And so I'm bringing all these ideas together. And I generally like, and have always liked to use humor in my work because I think that's a saving grace and you can bring some very strong and powerful ideas through, but as long as you can bring some humor to it, it keeps a lightness and I think and gives more accessibility. And collage as a technique, it has a lot of humorous potential built in because it's bringing together often disparate elements and into a new relationship. And that is, you know, not the norm and things that step out of the norm trigger us and we can look at that in different ways. And I think, as I say, through a um, the lens of, of humor is a very healthy way to approach a lot of these subjects. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. Like uh, you can get away with so much with, with humor and, and wit. And quite often the juxtaposition, the, the play on the play on words and humor and the kind of like free association is, is also quite an almost like surrealistic kind of technique. Yeah, um, this one's called Don't Look at Me in That Tone of Voice. Uh, uh, so again, I also like um, words when they use poetically, it's rather like collage in visual form 
that's a verbal form. Poetry can be that same kind of juxtaposition of disparate thoughts and elements um, that you don't have in normal logical writing. So I enjoy the combination and this book had overlays with poetry over the top of the images to even more embed and imprint that idea of this melding and bonding of the verbal collage and the visual collage. Ah, brilliant. It, it reminds me of, um, you know, William Burroughs' cut-up technique that, that Bowie was really into using, kind of right. like picking up words and like throwing them around randomly. No, that's, that's pretty much kind of what, what poetry does, isn't it? Uh, yes, no, um, I was going to go on to talk about, so um, I, in seven, 1973 at the Angela Flowers Gallery, you had an exhibit, uh, Tabletops and Mouthpieces. Uh, the majority was about life casts um, of yourself presented in the format of a table, um, as the theme was food and eroticism and the relation of the feminine to nourishment. Um, and this, I believe, led to the Bride's Cake photographic series, which I think is absolutely brilliant. And um, this is a few images from that series. It, it really is a strike of genius, the, the body in the Bride's Cake. So um, yeah, tell, tell us about the, this one. What was this all about? I decided to uh, try and meld the idea of the bride and the cake itself, because I felt there was a lot of um, worn out iconography around marriage in the sense of not just the iconography, but the actual institution itself wasn't really uh, holding water in the way that it had and that all the really juice had gone out of it. So I made this construction of this wearable wedding cake and then put myself in it and was photographed in all kinds of different ways so that I could bring together the whole um, idea of, you know, consummation and non-consummation and the, the juiciness of this whole thing that had become so um, kind of annihilated. And I had an image called Happy Anniversary where you have a wedding cake cut in half and it has doll's house furniture inside and the bride and groom uh, cut in half on the top of the, the cake. And it was trying to describe that alienation and institutional feeling that marriage had taken on and so looking at all the different aspects of, of this particular situation and the idea of marrying oneself too which has become a little more popular these days <laughs> yeah interesting yeah I, I loved um yeah the, also the width I, I saw the um the, the center image was called like promised a bed of roses and then there's another image called considered lilies which um does seem quite <laughs> quite edgy and and then also the the, the eye kind of um in the center kind of that to me seems like a really gnostic image of, of almost like you know the feminine as, as a portal to to the universe kind of a deeper deeper aspect of that um okay so yeah after that um well as part of that um exhibit there was also mouthpieces uh which was cast of the mouth and uh, uh let women speak very viscerally of uh, pleasure and pain because maybe the feminine hasn't always had a voice. And um, again, very, very witty title. So, so I wanted to ask you, um, uh, what is she saying? What, what are these mouths saying? Well, I made the whole series and I had a number of life casts of my mouth and a number of photographic collages. And in bringing together disparate elements and different associations with the mouth, what I was hoping to do was, again, looking at, we haven't had a voice, you know, the feminine has not had a voice. So I, in being the, the mouthpiece for that, I wanted to confound the norms and bring together here, you know, you see the, the eye, the, the yoni, the uh, ear, all put inside the mouth with titles like, you know, I hear what you say, I see what you mean, etc. so that we could start to uh, re-examine what uh, this mouth could actually articulate and what we feel with our senses. And so it was about sort of taking in and giving out in terms of that mouthpiece, what's it saying? And so these were in a way wordless statements, but ones which I felt needed to be heard to kind of wake people up to the voice of that silent feminine. Beautiful. Okay. 
Well, it was definitely um, very engaging images that, that command attention and we'll, we'll get people to listen. So, um, yeah, uh, leading on to, do, you did an incredible series of collages called Exorcism, which, which I think was probably one of the most profound pieces of work and probably one of the most difficult by the sound of it. So um, this is uh, started as a film project in 1969 with your partner, Peter Whitehead, in a big old Gothic mansion. Uh, which uh, was the ideal location for a film project exploring the metaphysics of the unconscious that actually turned into a real life psychodrama right um, and the film was mm -hmm. never completed and uh, mm -hmm. but you you did manage you made it into an evocative uh, collection of, of collages I, th I think the project um, was over seven years um, now I've got quite a few images from this series because I think it's really one of the edgiest and most profound reflections of the psyche that I've ever seen. Um, I'll, I'll just flick through it while you're while while you're talking and tell me if you ever want to stop. There's quite a few images, so I'll go through it quite fast. But um, I'm curious. I I remember you've told me before some stories, and um, what happened in that house, Penny? Like, like really with you <laughs> and Peter. Well, I use, I use the house as a symbol to represent the self. And it was such a powerful place to see this amazing classical mansion house, which represents the seat of power. And yet it was derelict and desolate and empty. And so um, taking that idea in my father's house and many mansions, I decided when my relationship with Peter broke up, as a result, a direct result of my participation with this all women's theatre group, which called Holocaust, um, which went on to make a film and in the process of all that, um, things happened which Peter didn't agree with. And so that relationship was in tatters and then the whole group of women dissolved and I felt lost and abandoned and didn't know who I was with both my feminine and masculine sides being, um, you know, split apart. So then I started on doing my own kind of psychoanalysis, if you like, process of self-discovery, using the symbol of this house and all its empty rooms to explore all the different rooms inside my psyche and try to paint the different kinds of moods and feelings that we have when we have this sense of loss and to try and find and reclaim myself apart from what the society projects on you and what's projected on you by your lover and relationships, who am I? And to try and uh, discover that like a detective story so that I could then come out the other side, um, reborn and unfold. And it was wow. a long process, took seven years of uh, work on this. And not only did I make the images, but I wrote and I designed film scripts which weren't made at the time, but uh, a lot of very, uh, deep soul searching went into all this and then to look at what are our fantasies to open those cupboards where we keep our skeletons and let them come out and dance and not be uh, afraid of them but to own them and to see through them therefore and uh, these parts here towards the end where the water is coming in and purifying and washing away everything then coming out like a butterfly being reborn to myself again so this was right. that I let unfold in this mansion house, like a, a gothic melodrama. <laughs> Amazing. I did. Um... I, th I did notice, like, if you look through the in the entire sequence, um, it 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 seems it, there's a very strong storyline. Um, it it seems like like an unfolding sequence, like an archetypal yeah. story. You know, like like the hero's journey, and you, you can see some themes and. Um, you could really read into read into it any anything you wanted to. I'm just going to look back so that I can kind of look look over through the through the overview. It it seemed to kind of start with like a on the site there was a man like with a key who was like unlocking yeah. something. And that's where I, that's Peter because Peter played the animus figure if you like in it, and he that image is with a brick wall behind the door and saying that this door, that which opens up to new potential is blocked. There's this horrific image of a brick wall blocking that door and the man holds the key, not me. How can I reclaim this? This is sort of like a starting image to say, how can I 
get my my key back to oh. uh, world of imagination and secrets and all that all those riches which have been locked away in a box like Pandora's box is a chapter called Pandora's box so ah so the, the key the key is the power it's like the power to be yes. in, in control of your destiny yes. and uh, that's Absolutely. that's really interesting I, I'll, re I'll go back to that in a in a second um, my thesis is that if you go deeply enough uh -huh. you have to be be not afraid to go deeply enough if you go deeply enough into your own personal issues you come to a place which is archetypal where if people don't have exactly the same experience they have something in their own dark nights of the soul and so forth that can resonate with and understand what you're depicting and so it helps to provide signposts through those um, dark tunnels and a, a golden thread like you know Ariadne had to follow through the, through the Oh, is that is that what the last image meant? I did want to ask you about this. This yes. that's what that's about. Yes, yes, those are the golden threads. I see. Fascinating. <laughs> and um, right, so if the key is the empowerment to be able to like unlock your destiny, and um, and then the, this looks very erotic and universal, and um, and then there's yeah, exploration and the owls. Uh, the, these owls, the, is, was that referring to Athena, the goddess Athena? Yes, this is called Enter Athena, and um, the actual owl mask is one which I made for uh, a play for a man, Francis Warner, who was doing a play called Lying Figures, and he wanted this owl mask, and so I made the whole owl mask, and before I gave it, I photographed it, and then I used that imagery, because all the way through my life, I have been particularly interested in the transformations and bird imagery have been uh, played a very key role in that so to right. transform into a, a bird I think is you know deep inside a lot of our fantasies and I try to express that in different ways. Okay interesting and yeah though in, you know going through this uh, there seemed to be a kind of a kind of judgment and then there's an emancipation there, there's a freedom um uh, at the end and the kind of, the right. kind of butterfly uh, thing mm -hmm. like it, as after she's gone through the dark night of the soul um mm -hmm. talking about the key thing i'm i'm gonna go from there to something of um a, a much more recent project that you were working on um or i think you were about to work on when i when i was um living with you in, in california um with mariah stark um, the musician, and um, I've really been resonating with this over the past couple of days because um, uh, the imagery um, of this, of the key and, and the chessboard um, is, is very, as you say, like, like these images resonate in the collective unconscious and they mean different things to different people. And uh, to me, the image of um, the chessboard and the keys and uh, the, the divination, it's a really strong image that, that I've been writing about for, for about 30 years. And I had a really strong uh, prophecy that, that happened to me. I think I remember telling you about when I was living with you that happened about 23 years ago. And the, the anniversary of that was actually yesterday. So <laughs> when I was looking through your work and I was like, oh my God, she did it. The, um, the theme was with Mariah, who's, who's a songwriter. And um, so I... Yeah, this, this is a really beautiful collage. And um, you were using poetry for that. And I um, just want to read one of the, I picked up one of the little bits of, po of the poems because um, I found it significant. And it's called, um, I, it says, holding the chessboard of all my deeds, all the light and dark of me, um, my own queendom shall set me free as time melts in the memory. I contemplate the great mystery um, am I but a piece on the board of life, or am I the shaper of my destiny? Um, which I think is very beautiful. And that I think that relates to these images we're looking at now. And that there was a lot more poetry that I won't go into. Uh, this one was about unlocking the heart. I think the bottom image, uh, you were using a bit of Blake, uh, that, that thing that was in, um, was in Tomb Raider, the thing about um, I see the world in a grain of sand with an eternity in the palm of your hand. Yeah. And, um, and then it ends with, a, with um, I, I think, a, the memory, the ghost of, of the past. Is that the top image? 
and then a phoenix mm. rising. So, so yeah, what, what you just said about how a key is actually, it's about power and taking control of your destiny. Is that pretty much the theme of this particular montage? It's called Queen of Keys, the whole series. And I don't know if you saw the, um, we made a music video from it. And yes. it was an interesting process of collaboration because I was trying to help Mary. I'd known her for a number of years and felt she had such a wonderful talent and wanted to help nurture that and uh, foster it and bring it out in her. So we did a photo shoot with no particular agenda just to try and help her feel more comfortable in front of the, the camera and own who she was. And after I had the photos, I just started playing with them. And this series emerged as I worked with them. And I showed them to Maria and she was so excited and said, oh, I want to write a song about this. So I sent her the poetry I'd been doing and she brought her own words to it as well. And she created a song, which then I made a music video where I used just going through all the different stills to her music. And so that was this collaboration that went back and forth between us. Right. Yeah, the, I checked out the whole series. It, it, was, it was really beautiful. And then running through the theme, it seemed to be um, freedom of choice, taking control of your destiny, unlocking your heart, and um, also, yeah, the emancipation um, at the end. Which right. was, yeah. and finding her bliss and uh, owning it. Freeing yeah. herself. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, going back to, uh, you mentioned dolls' houses, and um, you did a series of dolls' houses. Now, this is an interesting collage project because it's a collage, um, kind of 3D collage. Uh, so um, this is pretty erotic, this particular one, the red house. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us about your houses. <laughs> yes, I worked uh, on the houses, really coming out of having done this whole series over that seven years with the house and all the rooms of Milford Hall, which was that mansion house. I then had always had a fascination for dollhouses and thought that it was a great opportunity to try and make some adult themed dollhouses where I was taking some of the themes that I was working with in an exorcism and embodying them in the dollhouses. So, I approached each in different ways. And this one, as you say, is very much like a, a three-dimensional collage with cut-out elements combined with three-dimensional elements. Other ones had transformed dolls into birds, into all kinds of different uh, fantasy things. So there were um, uh, about uh, six, seven, eight dollhouses that I made in that period that uh, were tracking different themes and putting them in this format and using life cast in the middle there, there's life cast of the hands. This is about the laws of chance and uh, all of that, the, uh, the Ganesh house it's called. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got the Russian roulette um, uh, thing there again. Again, that's another on, ongoing theme, you know, chance, divination, oracles, playing with, mm -hmm. play, playing with destiny. Um, mm -hmm. Fascinating. So um, after the exorcism series, um, you kind of evolved out of that dark night of the soul into creating um, Mountain Ecstasy uh, series, which, um, which I believe was a really positive, um, positive development. And uh, this is in 1978, um, an exploration of uh, tantric art and collage in collaboration with your partner, Nick, Nick Douglas. And um, so you're evolving the themes um, using Egyptian, uh, Indian, occult sexual imagery um, to celebrate tantric alchemy and the divine feminine. And this is um, a really beautiful series with some incredible images in it. Um, this is the title piece. Um, yeah, can you explain what, what's going on here in this piece? The, uh, well, in this particular piece, this is what ended up on the cover, but we have, as you can see, the silver woman, again, transformed into the bird and through the Egyptian lens at this point with Egyptian um, mythology and spirituality has always been, and aesthetics of great interest to me. So 
Mandy next to see was really a celebration of all this multicultural um, and nature, all of these things blended together in this erotic dance, which out of coming out of the confines of the house and into this new relationship with Tantra, I had my partner, Nick Douglas, who I found, but um, he came into my life really to be the carrier of the information that I was looking for about Tantra, because I discovered Tantra when I went to the exhibition at the Hayward Gallery in the early 70s and felt that it was the whole next level on, on every level, the next level. My uh, artistic evolution from surrealism, which led the subconscious and unconscious areas to bring them to the light with all this imagery, which now I saw in the tantric imagery, but talking about them, the superconscious and about these next level of enlightened and liberated ideas and an idea of a spirituality that embraced and included one's sexual and sensual self and all that is really into this weave of one's spiritual and mundane life, I felt was the key that I'd been waiting for. And so this series of collages was really the celebration of that coming into my life and just enjoying it, going out of the black and white into the technicolor dream world of all of this dance of creation. And I was doing this series and using the opportunity to share with my partner Nick the techniques of collage. And we were just doing these for our own absolute pleasure. And then Dragon Queen came along, the publisher, and wanted to put it together into a book. And we said, oh, well, are you sure? It's, you know, quite risky. <laughs> and we said, yes, absolutely. Well, as it happens, um, thousands and thousands of copies got seized by British Customs coming in from um, Rotterdam, where they'd been printed, and got burned. So uh, they didn't know the difference between pornography and the... Uh, alchemy of it all, which is what we were doing in the book, was making everything sacred, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. I, th I think when you get properly banned or censored or all your books are burned, you know that you're onto something. I, I think that's <laughs> <laughs> part, part of the whole success, definitely. <laughs> In terms of collage, because we're talking about collage a lot today for this um, particular uh, presentation and workshop. Mm -hmm. In this book, I used hardly any images that were taken by myself, whereas for an exorcism, nearly all of it were my own and my partner's photographs. So it was a different approach, um, but in this one, it was just all, you know, objet trouvé in, in that sense of images that I collected and found. Uh -huh. And also, I mean, you were drawing on, you know, very traditional, like um, Indian, Indian tantric, like, I mean, this is, this is Kali, an image of, of Kali that you're using here. I mean, I, I think the, the only one of my paintings I'm going to show in this, in this conversation is, is the one I did recently of, of Kali um, that I, I spoke to you about when I, when I was just finishing it, I thought to consult you. And Akali is such a powerful tantric goddess in, in that she, she chops off all of the, the ego, the source of, of wounding to release us uh, beyond birth and sex and death, beyond all of that, to, to the void, to the pure bliss. Um, but it, it's, a bit, it's a very tough path, um, but also deeply enlightening. So, I mean, you were drawing on um, deep esoteric secrets of, of tantra, which really kind of like cover all of life, don't they? And, yeah. yeah so from there um later later on from mountain ecstasy that um that evolved into creating the book um sexual secrets actually i'll go here uh, in 1979 which you did with uh, nick uh, douglas um the alchemy of ecstasy featuring more than 600 illustrations created by you. You're incredibly prolific, Penny. I don't know how you do it. Um, but I, it became one of the best-selling books um, about Tantra, love and sexuality. And um, uh, this is one of the drawings um, from that. And from that, you evolved and created the Secret Dakini Oracle. Um, I, 
which yeah was a 65 card divination deck um using tantric iconography so again you can work with it in an intuitive way like a pack of cards and this is some some of the images um i've, I've been trying to decode that i, I recognize the caduceus in, in mercury and the scarlet one looks like carly um yeah yeah now this was actually um the uh dakini oracle deck evolved at about the same time as Mountain Ecstasy. They were being done kind of in parallel. And we weren't, uh, when we had the publisher, that he didn't want any um, erotic imagery in it so that he could sell it in Disneyland or wherever he liked. So this didn't have any of the eroticism, um, but all of that went into the Mountain Ecstasy series. And both series were 64 series, so they kind of complement each other. and. This divination deck and the one that you were talking about, my oracle that's online that I did more recently, are both based on the 64 yogini temples of India, which are some of the most beautiful and powerful embodiments of Shakti and forms of female wisdom energy that um, I've ever seen created. And uh, there are 64 goddesses, very surreal goddesses in a circular format. And that's been the inspiration for these two bodies of work. And these are from the, the later oracle where I fully embodied and personified each of the energies, whereas in the earlier Secret Dakini oracle, uh, many were more abstract and not just female forms, but each of the ones in the oracle that I did later are uh, all women. And uh, from all kind of culture and time, I wanted to make it more global than just something that would be limited to cult and set of India. I wanted this to be something which would be a, a, a temple to the goddess and a global level that people could consult and get direct access and communication with these wisdom archetypes, which we have within us all, just how to get access to them. So this was a way. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the fascinating thing about that, this is an image um, in Anna from, from that deck, from the more recent uh, deck, the 64 Dakini Oracle. Um, and the fascinating thing about this Oracle is, is yes, I, as, as I said earlier, like, like some of them are um, very traditional, like Quan, Quan Yin, this is the Quan Yin, this is an Anna. But also you made up um, some archetypes that are very specific to this age, like, like media woman or... Right. or um, right. Uh, kind of all about like like social media, uh, very kind of like modern archetypes. So the, these images um, are uh, they're timeless and they're also really really relevant right now. And th this is what Freud was talking about: the the collective unconscious, the, these powerful archetypes that resonate with everybody in in some kind of super conscious way. But um, a, a lot of the a lot of the amazing women that you that you pick to model for this are, are very, they kind of embody the characteristics. I know I do the same in my own work. Um, when, I, when I pick a model for a painting, often very synchronistically, the right person will come into my sphere when I'm working with that particular mm -hmm. goddess. And they will have very mm -hmm. real messages um, that play out uh, in, in a very real way. So when you work with these images, um, uh, it, it definitely has power. In, in your life when you invoke an archetype. But um, I thought uh, just to end this, um, this interview and lead into the workshop uh, aspect, um, I thought it might be nice if we pick a couple of, um, a couple of these uh, Dakinis you, using this uh, the Dakini Oracle and um, we could kind of hand it over to Chance and the combined group energies of everyone who's present um, I, to, to choose one. <laughs> so um, I guess I would ask like every, everyone who's present, try, try and tune into me right now, right? <laughs> Especially Penny and um, tune into this wheel that we're all collectively looking at. And um, uh, let's consult the Oracle. Okay, Sophia. Tell us about Sophia. <laughs> Sophia, okay. So Sophia is boldly 
taking the whole capitalistic tradition and embodying it. She has the whole capitalistic tree actually painted on her body. You can't see so well from the long shot here, but um, she is the full, uh, fully owned uh, bridge between the etheric and the material world. And for me, this is one of the greatest gifts of, of Tantra, that it is about embodied spirituality. And this is what we've you know, been missing in our years of um, demeaning the feminine, we've also been missing out on the fact that the sacred is in everything and that we are not separate from that. And every blade of grass and everything around it is part of the sacred path and should be honored as such. And so she is bringing this whole transmission into the world for now as part of her feminine being as the body of the goddess. And all these are, of course, digital collages. So this is another face of working with collage when I discovered the computer and what you could do with Photoshop and everything. That's when I had to start using those tools because for a committed collage artist, it was irresistible. It's like the Holy Grail of how you could do so much more with digital collage, have so much more control over so many more parameters. And uh, just now coming back to working with analog collage for preparing for the workshop, it's so interesting to see the similarities and the difference between these ways of working. And they're both super valued and both have so much to offer, but I'm so glad to have the ability to be able to work in these different mediums and forms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean, they're, they're tools, aren't they? But, um... So it's the tree of life. It's the Kabbalah on her body. It's Eliza. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs> like, thinking, um, yes. You can't. Uh, we'd have to see how closer to see all the detail of that. But uh -huh. part of the whole process of doing the shoots was taking each of the women who were selected to be the embodiment of that archetype through a process of transformation. And while she was lying there, having all these uh, centers placed on her body, she felt it. And every time we would all feel how powerful this particular um, ability we have within us all. And this was part of the whole idea that we could put our small selves aside and actually become one with these divine archetypes through this ritual process. And in this case, the ritual process is doing the shoot and doing mm. the transformation. Yeah, it, it's such a powerful process. I've got like, uh, behind me, you can see if I, um, I've been working on myself as my own muse and this is my Aphrodite painting and I, I actually painted myself and it, mm -hmm. it, it's such a powerful process when you evoke a, an archetype and you have to be prepared of the lessons that she might bring you. Um, it might be kind of difficult. There's another one, Bridget, in the background, which was a friend but kind of also was me. Um, yeah, but they, they have a lot we have a lot to teach us. Should we pick one more but just before we go into the workshop? Because it's kind of fun, right? Yeah, I'm going to hit it again. <laughs> yeah, every, everyone can play with this to their heart's content. Oh, Isis. There you go. <laughs> uh, right. Well, there she is standing between the pillars of light and dark, you know, holding and balancing all the elements. Uh, Isis is the, the great priestess of all that is and the above and below and all that integrated and her aunt, which is eternal life. And so that bridge again, between the worlds that I did so beautifully represents and the way that she brought her dead husband back to life, breathed life in him to bring forth the new winged being that um, was created through this process. She is a, a female magician and out of the Egyptian mysteries, uh, but an eternal vibration and frequency, which we can tune into and own the qualities that she had. And this particular one, that is me under all that glue. Uh, I'm in a few of them. I had um, you know, many, many other women who took on the room for all the different ones. And that was part of it too, to show that uh, it's not just something that one special person can get access to the divine frequencies that is open to anyone who's prepared to do the work, and put themselves aside and be open to embracing that. And so I think that our 
experiment in doing this whole oracle really brought that home to everyone involved that that was real and we could all feel it and experience it. Fantastic. Oh, what, what, yeah, that's um, definitely a reflection, a reflection on yourself. Um, yeah, so I, oh, hang on, let's go back to, just wanted to go back to, just want to show you, um, here's one I made earlier. <laughs> this is my effort, like, um, after that pilgrimage I did with um, Daisy Campbell last year. Um, yeah, very nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we created, um, we all created exactly what we're about to do now. Um, we all created a kind of a tarot card of ourselves, um, mm -hmm. using ourselves as the, as the muse, a kind of, kind of card that summed up the archetypal energy that we wanted to bring to the group. And there were 69 of us, and we went on a double-decker bus from CERN um, Abbas in Dorset, uh, the big chalk man, to CERN in Switzerland uh, to um, immunitize the eschaton. There's a bit of a caper. And um, this was my card. This is my archetypal card. So we ended up with a kind of tarot deck of, of characters. And it's uh, the creatrix. And uh, she's, uh, she's a little bit spooky, but kind of nice. And um, if you uh, flip her around, then you see it's the creatrix, you know? So, so she's, she's creative, but there's, there's a and creative and destructive. And I was really fascinated with um, this picture of the snake, that if, if a snake, which is always a phallic injury, if, like they open, oh, that's so nice. um, if, if they open their mouths really wide, then it looks feminine. It looks like a vagina. It's like, oh my God. So it's like the masculine is within the feminine, the feminine is within the masculine, which is kind of fascinating. Mm -hmm. So um, that's my effort. So um, over to you and the practical aspect of the workshop, and let's let's all create our own our own muse. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. Um, have, we, have we maybe got just time for a, for a couple of questions? Just to, just between now and the workshop, do you think? I think that's. If anybody's got any any kind of pressing questions now. So yeah, that's my creatrix image called creatrix from my uh, Dakini cycle. And that's the game me and all the bubbles, each of them have one of the 64 Dakinis, Yoginis in them. And I've got the magic paintbrush, like you have the magic paintbrush there, which is bringing down the, uh, the energies from up here <laughs> into, into the uh, manifestation. Penny, can I can I just just uh, just ask? I'm just really interested how um, yes. your your work and your um, experiences changed or evolved you as a, as as Penny Slinger the person. Oh gosh, that's an interesting. Uh, I have all my life really my um, my work and who I am have been so intertwined. And I felt very strongly that um, artists who did their art on one hand and then lived their life on another hand and then somehow the two were tried to be kept separate, that this wasn't really what it was all about. To me, it's a very integrated pro process. And so I've tried to be as transparent as possible in everything that I've done. and. Um, tried to use myself as my own example, a little bit like, you know, Frida Kahlo said, was asked, why do you paint yourself so much? And she said, well, I'm the person I know best. And also as a, a tenet of, you know, spiritual work, who am I? It's like a first principle. And so I have throughout my life used my art as a self-reflector to try and know more about myself and in turn, as those things have, um, have come real, the more you can manifest something, the more you're able to, to own that too. And in manifesting the reflector for yourself, if that reflection is true enough, it becomes a reflection for others too that can help them see themselves. And um, in fact, at, at one point, I remember uh, a girlfriend of mine uh, saw me at one point and said, oh my goodness, uh, I'm looking at the goddess in you. And I made a little prayer inside at that time of uh, if someone looks and sees that, may she see it as a reflection of her own inner goddess. And so 
for me, my work uh, has been in the constant state of evolution as I am myself. And on one hand, I think we kind of come in whole. We are who we are right from the beginning, but perhaps all the way through what we do with our lives is our process of remembering and putting ourselves, who we really are, back together again from the forgetfulness of being born and coming into material form. So my process is an interactive one, going back and forth all the time. So I don't really see a lot of separation between um, my own personal uh, evolution as a person and my evolution as an artist. And I do look and see repeating patterns too, that um, those designs, if you like, are part of our, our intrinsic design and, and the imprint and blueprint that we are meant to bring forth. And so we find ourselves going back into those patterns again, not deliberately, but just because those are our patterns to, to show. And the particular one, the being in the house and doing that whole series of an exorcism and then coming out into mountain ecstasy and celebrating that. I've just been doing a similar pattern now because I've been creating a series in the pandemic called My Body in a Box and using myself at my age now, my naked body in a box has been the symbol of what we've all been put in now during this time of sheltering in place and all of the fears of the pandemic. And then we took one trip and went to Utah and went to these beautiful mountains in Bryce and Zion. And I took a lot of photographs and I'm now doing a series of blending different um, women with these mountains. And I hadn't realized until I looked and said, ah, oh, it's the same thing <laughs> from the box, from the house, from the confines into the mountain. And every time blending that rich feminine energy with all of all of nature as opposed to being locked in in these, you know, confining and restricting areas that have been we've been placed in. Um, so yeah, these these patterns just cycle through. <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. No, it does. That's wonderful. Yeah, great. Thanks for thanks for talking that through. That's great. Hey, Penny, just a question. Um, out of, um, Any other questions? Yeah, just one more question. I don't know if can you can hear me. Yes. Oh, hi, sorry. Thank you, Penny. Uh, it was a quick question just with respect to analog uh, collage or hmm. uh, sort of verses or using uh, Photoshop and the like. Do you have a preference or do you just like flitting between the two or how do you feel about that? Well, over the last years, I guess since um, really certainly this whole uh, century, I've been working mainly in the digital field because it's been, it's provided the tools that I didn't have doing analog collage. And I remember after doing the three series uh, as embodied in 50% The Visible Woman, then an exorcism, then Mountain Ecstasy. At the end of that, I thought, you know, I, I feel like I've explored kind of what I can with this medium at the moment. And only if I had more control over parameters like transparency and size and color and all these things, um, I felt like I, I wanted the ability to have more control over those things to, to take it further. And then along came um, Photoshop and all those tools and there were the tools. So I've been um, working mainly uh, with those um, tools of the digital realm ever since. But it's interesting because when I was younger, of course, analog collage wasn't necessarily, even then, always considered to be really a fine art form. And I remember having a show back in 77 in London, where the gallery owner and the day before the show was to open said, how can we charge these kind of prices? These are just bits of paper stuck together. So that attitude was there then, that's not there now. Um, collage is a pretty highly respected form, but still digital collage is uh, a little questionable in some fine art 
fields. And of course, with the advent of all the things we can do with digital collage, it's become much more available to people too. So, so many people now can work in this medium which couldn't work in it before. And so it's created a, a little bit of a trivialization. So what becomes really important, I think, for the serious collage artists is what your content is, what you're actually trying to say, having something that's your theme and that's important because it's so easy to produce shocking and surreal images now um, that we have to have a purpose behind it that gives it breadth and depth rather than just, you know, flash of the pan appeal. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, okay, I think uh, I think Emma's connection has dropped. So, um, Penny, do, do you want to? Should we should we go to the into the workshop part of sure, the session? Yeah. Should I just hand over to you and let you okay. let you lead this? So I wrote up something about what we need for this. Um, I thought you know, seeing is one of the main things that I've focused on in my life has been using myself as a muse and that art of self-observation through these tools of collage. Um, I thought that this would be a good thing to share because all of us have ourselves and that image of oneself um, has been, again, in this time of social media where so many people are posting so many images of themselves and with wanting to be liked it's again created a, a tendency for a superficiality and for not really using these art forms to, to probe and delve and penetrate. So I kind of wanted to bring that back to people with the idea of, in the title of the art of seeing oneself, how to use collage as a tool for self-revelation and self-definition. And one of the reasons, again, that I like to use my own image is the fact that I thought I could be much more ruthless and brutal with my own image than it might be fair to do with the, somebody else's image. And so it's a good place to start with, you know, how do we see ourselves and how can we use collage to show more about ourselves than we can do by um, a photograph or any other representation that's just about how we look. How do we look inside and how can we use collage to express and explore that? And I thought to go to the tools of analog collage, we could do another workshop with digital collage, I'd be happy to do that. But um, analog collage is really fun. And going back to using it again, I saw so much the difference um, in that you, you can't make the kind of choices and selections that you can with digital collage. You have to use what you've got. And so that uh, allows for a certain kind of extra surreal edge and a kind of creativity where you put things together in surprising ways, which if you're thinking it through and selecting images to serve the purpose and can shape them exactly to that, you don't quite have that sort of magical edge of bringing things together that um, create a new reality out of these pieces. It's really like form following what that functionality is, what you have on your table. So to, uh, as we have just a few people here for this workshop, hopefully uh, we can deliver something here that others can um, tune into later as well and be able to use it as a tool for their own exploration. So I'm saying here, the idea is to create a collage self-portrait that incorporates imagery in a surreal style to express who you are in an unconventional fashion, seeking to reveal the inner you rather than the person you're recognized by. Mm -hmm. So that's the, um, you know, the template here and what you'll need for this. So a photograph or photographs of yourself, um, big if possible, uh, to use, and that will be your ground, your basis that you're going to work with. And you can either collage directly onto the photograph or use it to refer to and create collage elements that are referring to that image as you do it. 
Um, and if you want a mirror, uh, that's another tool that can be helpful in the process. And then in terms of collage materials, I suggested that people collected together imagery that they felt could be relevant for this and cut things up beforehand if you can. Uh, I think one of the main tools that um, is super important, whether you're working digitally or analog, is how you make your selections, i.e. how you cut your things out. So whether it's some scissors or a scalpel, or whether it's your, your mouse, you need to make good, clean selections if you want your thing to look seamless. So of course you can make chunky selections if you want it to look that way, but that's a, a choice you need to make. And then those elements will, will serve you well. So you get all those ready and you need your paper or ground to, to work. And I'm assuming people here have got some sort of experience in collage, so I don't want to be too ABC about it, but you've got your images together and you, I put here for free to choose imagery that one would not generally associate with portraiture. Uh, other items to incorporate beyond just paper and photos could also be used. So you can, you know, put in feathers or uh, shells or jewelry or anything else you like. Collage allows for this incorporation of other things as well. And, you know, scissors, glue, I find like Yoohoo glue is a really good glue for collage um, rather than water-based glue and some kind of board or paper you can assemble it all on. And I suggested too that it'd be good to have tracing paper, pencil and transfer paper. If in analog collage, you're not going to be able to put something in the background of the face unless you cut things out. So you might want to make a tracing of the face and then uh, transfer that day to a a sky that you're wanting to select and then add around that. So these are the, the, the simple elements that we use to, to start this process. And then uh, I'm here to, you know, help facilitate your process. And I hope that those who are present will be able to create at least something of this, even if not a finished piece, um, so that we are able to share before the workshop's over. And I'd love to not only see what you're doing, but hear what you have to say about it, because this whole idea that one can use collage to explore means that as you explore, you maybe turn up things that you didn't even know until you started the process. So I think this is a, a meaningful feedback to be able to share your thoughts about what you're creating, your intentions as well. So that's the starting point. And I myself, um, as I started looking through, I have old collage material from back in the 70s, which I haven't thrown away. And I started putting together, you know, but I have different things with cut out elements and then each of them has a, a category name. This one is shells, you know, so I've got all kinds of shells cut up in there. And then I find that this is a useful a source material to have. And then you you bring your, your main basic image out, which will be yourself in this case. And then you have all your other source material around. And then it's like a, a, a theater and a dance. And you bring all your elements out to be able to start coming and playing on this stage, which is your image and let them dance together and see see what works. So that's what I've got to say to start. And does anyone have any? I have a few images too. Jules, do you have those that I thought might be inspirational? And Archimboldo and a couple of other um, reference images just to give people an idea of the kind of way one can reimagine a portrait. Do you have those to hand if not? Never mind. No. I was going to say, sorry, uh, I've been sharing a few images over the past couple of days. Um, Don't worry. But I will... If they come up, bring them up later. But um, Try and put some on the screen as well.
And I, I've got a. Um, this is Archim. I printed of myself, which is from you know when I was younger, obviously, but it's still me, and that's a a good a good place to to start. I don't know what anyone else has. This is Alison. Can I share this? Um, can everybody see that? Right, right. So, so that's Daydreamer. That was a, an image that I thought was uh, pretty inspirational. And this is the uh, Rowan Penrose. Yeah, Roland with my patron for many years, a wonderful surrealist artist and writer and supporter of artists. And this was a portrait of his first wife, Valentine. And uh, I, I love this with the juxtaposition, obviously, of all the butterflies and the yeah. It's a painting, but it's like a collar. Um, and then this is Archimboldo. Yes, Archimboldo is classic uh, in the way he composed all of these different portraits with different materials. This one with fish and things from the sea. And then he's well known for the ones he made with, with vegetables and fruits and um, just so creative and wonderful. Yeah. And then we have a uh, woman of flowers as well. Yeah, this is lovely because it has all the petals. Yeah. All the and so just different ways that you can uh, create these new looks, you know, with whole, whole images or petals of things, yeah. in different approaches that are all relevant and uh, just the question of what you feel most attracted yeah. to and what most sort of describes who you are. Okay. So shall we, shall we what, do this for, what, 30 minutes? Because it's uh, sort of seven. Yes, five, however, two, however seven, everyone wants checking to. Checking in maybe 30 minutes and see how things are going. Okay. But people can interact with me during this process, share things, ask questions, do anything while you're while you're working on it. It's totally welcome, and I'll play with my images here. Penny, Penny, I'm I'm interested in um, uh, an image that you just showed, uh, like like the dreamer, all the kind of like clouds going across. Um, uh, yeah. Do you get a lot of inspiration from from dreams? Can, and can you lucid dream? Can you do that? <laughs> yes, and I mean, I uh, at one point I did sort of do that as a, a practice. I not doing that as a practice anymore, but sometimes those dreams come through which are like that. You know, you, you wake up and something feels very, very real. I think dreams have so many different flavors to them. Some are just an obvious processing of things that have happened in life and you're um, processing it in a kind of fearful way or whatever. Um, and then others which have a much different flavor and feeling to them, which feel prophetic and feel archetypal. And it's those um, where you almost feel like you're going back and revisiting a dream space that you've been to on other occasions. And those are the places that I find one can retrieve imagery from. But I do have myself, uh, I guess, the gift or the ability just to see a lot of visions always. So it's like um, waking dreaming a lot that have my whole mind sky is filled with uh, a lot of a lot of visions always so it's always had a, a, a rich inner life um and that's why I've, I've loved the uh the dissolving of boundaries between what is the subconscious and what's the conscious life and how to bring those together and um you know bring bring the day and night into more more resonance and more availability so that we start to deal with all of ourselves rather than just the mundane material side of who we are, but mm. the archetypal landscape of being that uh, 
we are part of the Virgilian collective. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I know. Um, the further you kind of, the more you focus on it, the the greater it becomes. I know, I know I get this um phenomena where if I if I have a strong archetypal dream, and then that will quite often link up with something happening the next day, um, or some the first thing that I'll see in waking reality, and the whole kind of like um line between the, the dream and the waking reality is completely blurred to the point that my life feels like a dream <laughs> like one big long right. synchronistic dream and right. Um, right. like for example the other day um I, I, we're, we're part of a green dream group in the um uh, kate alderson's kind of um got a kind of like group dreaming group which is this, um affiliated with the pilgrimage that, that we went on where we were exploring these ideas in the subconscious and there, there was you know a while everyone was thinking about owls and dreaming about owls and then um i i was out on a walk with a friend and and we came across this like giant owl temple with these um at wakehurst and like i had no idea that it was there and i've been dreaming about owls everyone had been talking about owls and the next thing i know we're in this giant owl temple made out of wicker with four owls at the four quarters and it's like of course why <laughs> you know of course we're in this giant symbolic thing but um yeah there's, there always seems to be when you get into this world of mythology and image and symbolism the synchronicities just start to get more and more ridiculous um to the point that it's like life is laughing at you with you. <laughs> oh my God, did you say you met Max Ernst? Yes, I did. <laughs> I know, it was a great moment. Well, my, I was lucky enough because I uh, had got in touch with Roland Penrose when I started doing my thesis. I was trying to find anyone in England who really understood about surrealism. And at that point, it really, it wasn't much discussed in the history of art that we had. And it was um, a rather rarefied field, which not a lot seemed to be known about. And I was directed towards Roland Penrose by a, a mutual friend. And I met Roland and Roland was so kind and generous and had such a marvelous collection of surrealist art, which he was happy to talk about with so much enthusiasm. And he was a personal friend of Max Ernst. And so when I went over to Paris on a trip with the college, um, Roland was over at the same time and he said, I'll, I'll take you to meet Max Ernst. And so I was able to do that. And I'd taken a rather Jungian approach with my um, interpretation of Max Ernst books and uh, symbols of transformation and psychology and alchemy and so I wanted to really check in with Max Ernst himself and make sure that he felt okay about that and luckily he did so I could then submit my thesis with Max Ernst's blessing and he gave me a signed copy of Unsaman de Bonte which had come out in a, in a, in a, a reprint of the first reprint and it was just one of those more magical moments of my life to be able to to meet this artist who no, had such a powerful influence on me. I'm sorry, the name Roland somebody? Roland oh, Penrose. He's, um, uh, he's passed now, but he was uh, he wrote many books um, on Picasso, on different people. He's uh, both a great artist, philanthropist, and he Lee Miller, who was the muse of Man Ray and uh, uh, another powerful, uh, extraordinary woman. So all of that was, I was lucky enough to spend time with both of them during that period. I'm so very sorry. I missed Roland's surname for the third time. Penrose. They still have, um, his son runs the, um, foundation uh, where they have a collection and they have pieces of my work down in Sussex, Farley Farm. And they have a marvelous collection of surrealist art and Lee Miller's work. And uh, it's worth a trip when you can go to different places again to go and, and visit that collection. It's really near me. I, I must remember to go there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Um, of course, um, I, uh, Mac, Max Ernst was also um, uh, had a relationship with Leonora Carrington, didn't he? Who's another yeah. incredible feminine figure who, who worked with uh, dreams and the psyche a lot. That I know I find to be a big influence. Yes, yes. And then he was married to Dorothea Tanning at the time that I met him. Right. It's such a, a web, such a net of um, inf uh, different influences of like, of like different artists. It's, it's like right now, we're, yeah, we're all kind of like collected. You could uh, connected, you can draw a family tree between all the, all the artists and how we all influence each other. <laughs> Does anyone 
Does anyone want to, while we're doing this, um, does anyone want to spin, spin the wheel of the 64 Dakini Oracle? It's a kind of like, yeah, Jed? Yeah, I wanna. Yeah, yeah, do it. Have you, have you got the link? Um, um, I did try, but then I tried to download the, you, you were saying that you need something and I was doing that and it just wouldn't work. So I'll try anyway. You know what, I find that it works in, um, I find that it works in Safari better, personally. Okay. Um, but I have to download something else? Flash drive. I saw that okay. tool and then I didn't do it. That's That was an obstacle for me too, so I understand, Jed. Right. Oh, okay. That's what pops up, it's true. Yeah. I mean, no, given it, a well, I find it, that that pops up in Chrome, but in Safari, it, it just works. So try it in Safari, I would urge you. Right, because it's made with Flash, and Flash is getting a little bit outdated now. So um, um, sometimes it's not going to be working properly. I need to do something new again, because it's been up for a few years like that. I need to do an app or something where we're going to be, or get them printed so that we'll be able to access them again more easily. But um, that's what we've had for now, and uh, hopefully we can get it to work. Yeah. You know, analog to collage is so interesting because you, as I say, working for so long in digital collage and being able to control so many parameters, coming back to it, it's suddenly like you can't get necessarily what you think you want. But then in that process, because you can't get what you thought you want, you can get something else there. And that, that something else often tends through that restriction to open up new possibilities and new kind of aspects of um, the creative imagination by working with what you have rather than what you necessarily might think um, you'd ideally like to have, having just those certain images and tools at your disposal is a, can be a very um, creatively inspiring and also get you to make unusual choices that um, you wouldn't necessarily make if left to just your own devices of being able to control it all. So, I think for any artist, it's fun to have certain control and then also very stimulating to have certain limitations as well, because within those strictures and limitations often can be found some of the most expansive new ways of looking at things. <laughs> I just made it work on my computer. So shall I just press the button and swing the wheel? Yeah, go for it. How about, um, can you screen share so that we can see what- Oh what... boy, now you're asking <laughs> something. Okay, so, okay, so put, put your, put your cursor. <laughs> I'm working here with three screens at the moment. I'm like multitasking. I'm becoming <laughs> a screen myself. Giles, is she able to screen share? If you, if you put, put your cursor over your screen, and you should, if, if it's possible, you should see a big green button saying share screen at the bottom. Okay. There you go, he's made you the yeah. cards. You should oh, be able to do it. Now. Okay, let me see. Wait, uh, other screen, this one, share screen. Okay, uh, what, what are you seeing? You're seeing a lot. Wait a minute, this is not... This is like, what, what am I sharing now? This put, just, just put your cursor over the screen, see the big green button, you hit share screen, and we should then be able to see basically what you see. Yeah, but you see my whole desktop, which is useless. So, <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? Maybe just, maybe just get up the Dakini um, Oracle first so that we're not <laughs> going to see like, you know, the intimate details of whatever else you have on the desktop. So I'm double checking what you see and I'm trying to focus on, okay, um, wow, boy oh boy, one hand, 
another hand holding another screen. I love this. <laughs> oh, well, let's- Yeah, we got you. There you go. There. Okay, spinning. Excellent. Is it moving? Yeah. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Ah. Oh. Okay. So if you go to the top, you should see an option for the text, um, which will give you the the reading um, uh, and explain to you what this is all about. Is is that algae algae woman? Yes, Algaia. Yes. Uh, let me see yeah. to the top. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Where am I? To the top. Oh, stop sharing. Actually, in in the Zucchini Oracle. Um, oh, in the Zucchini. That, yeah, in the Zucchini Oracle on that page. In fact, it's strange. It's I don't see the option. No, exactly. That's also what. But it's possible because of my computer. It's it's an old lady, you know. <laughs> Wait a minute. Here we are. There you go. Text reading. Can you read it? Yeah. Um, do you want me to read it? Sure. Okay, because then you can you can keep working. So um, I, I'll get Algaia in the primal soup where water mixes with the earth. Algaia replicates, creating matter. So who is Algaia? Algaia is the Dakini who dwells within and activates the primal ooze of creation. She is the raw material holding the building blocks of all terrestrial life. She is the embodiment of, of the algae, uh, the microbial bile and the microchondria that take sunlight and translate it into matter. She is mud woman. She contains all microbial, microbial worlds. Uh, she is host to all the microscopic beings, which are the rich soup of existence. She makes you confront your reactions to what is perceived as clean and dirty. She is mm -hmm. the mistress of photosynthesis. Um, wow. Primal soup. <laughs> <laughs> I, <Blood. laughs> lovely. That's a good inspiration to keep working. Go down to the bottom of the reading and you'll see affirmations and her little kind of poem that we have that is a nice summing up. Oh, yeah. Right. If you go right down to the bottom, because it's a long more. So, okay. Yes, right down, right down. Indications? Oh, uh, no. Underneath. You'll see. Oh. Wow. Okay. Wow. It should be Small. right at the bottom. Uh, uh, affirmation. And Let's see if I can get there. Oh, wow. This maybe is... you can't get there. That's okay. It's I can find there. it myself. Hang on. Let me get my book. Just a small screen I'm working on. And then you're like, oh. <laughs> Can we get there? No. Wow. Why can't I get there? Okay. No I'm, idea. I've got it here. Oh, thank you, Penny. That's just. Here we are. So her transmission is from my body, life emerges. I feel it dividing and multiplying within the cells of me. Life creating life floods my being with ecstasy while I rise orgasmically. And her affirmation is, my being is comprised of intelligent colonies. I honor every cell of my body as equal to myself. I'm connected to the cellular consciousness of all being. Or potential. So that's her key. Wow. He he wrote that. Who wrote it? Yes, please. Oh. The the Dakinis wrote it through me. <laughs> Thank you, the Dakinis. 
It really was like that because um, mm -hmm. at a certain point I'd been writing up all the uh, the transmissions for each part and I was doing it in longhand and then coming to the computer and putting it in and on about three different uh, write-ups I had forgotten that I'd done it already so I had it done twice and when I read it they were <laughs> they were almost word for word the same <laughs> so I knew that uh, I wasn't just making it up it was something that was coming coming through me where am I cut Does anyone else want to want to spin? Want to pick a? Um, I'm going to spin. I managed to get it there, but I don't know about sharing the screen. Hang on a sec. Okay. Mm. Can you make Can you make a co co-host, Giles? Wait. Screen. Oh yeah. Hold shift to select. You should be able to do it now, Jed. Yeah, there Is that you go. Working? Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. I love it. <laughs> I'll never come off this thing. <laughs> wow. Ah. Mother Yen. Mother Yen. So true. Mm. Each of the Dakinis really represents a, like an elemental signature too, because they are the embodiment through the elements. And Mother Yin is the most solid, the most dense of all. She's like the rocks and the pure substance of the earth itself. She's uh, number 64. Mm. Was this before or after the opium advert of Sophie Dahl? The one? <laughs> there was an opium perfume advert of Sophie Dahl in the same position, an English ah. model, the granddaughter of Roald Dahl. Oh, right. Sorry to when be was so that? Silly. I don't know. Probably in the 90s, Miss. Ah, I didn't um, even see that. I was probably in the Caribbean at that point. Oh, la, la. So what's the meaning of Mother Yen? She is the pure element of the earth. Uh, in all its manifestations. Who is Mother Yin? There are four elemental daikinis in the pantheon. Mother Yin represents the earth element and holds the southern node of the mandala. She is the nature of earth in all its forms. Location, sphere of influence, the earth itself in all its forms, form from stalactite rocks, mountains to ore, earth and sand. Allies, turtle, rocks, mountain, grains of sand, the earth itself. Nature and description of Daikini Maha Yin is solidity, density, and specific gravity. She represents longevity and is still slow, deep, and meditative. She is strong, firm, and enduring, solid as a rock. She forms your dependable foundation. She is the most solid, <clears throat> has the most density of all Daikinis. She forms the basis of all terrestrial life. She is the quality of the very earth itself from ore to mountain, rocks to sand. <clears throat> she dwells in the dark caverns of the earth. Her body is the rock, the mountain and the soil, the body of the earth. She manifests all in the textures of the substance of the planet. She is the consciousness of the stones, the primordial, prim primal vibration in the cave of creation. Mm. Amen. Um, she, 
She is the substance of the planet, the palette of her being is reflected in the colors of the skin of the different races of the world. That's nice. As the earth is often represented by the square, Mother Yin represents herself as the landscape of the four directions, guarding the four gateways. In the center, she lies back to provide the ground of all being. She opens herself in support of life. The dark yoni vulva of the earth is seen beneath her hair, center at the volcanic landscape that births the new earth. Mother Yin stands beyond on the back of turtle. She takes the classic pose of the Paleolithic mother goddess statues and holds the horn of plenty, representing the abundance of the earth. The turtle signifies the primal mother and represents longevity. It is connected to earth, the feminine and to lunar cycles. In myths from different cultures, the turtle is the one who supports earthly life on its back. Oh, I love turtles, I love them. Behind her is Mount Meru, <laughs> a mountain in the Himalayas that is both physically manifest and a place mythologically known as the center of the universe. A gift from Mother Yin of grounding deep in the core of your being, re-establishing a connection to things from ground up, getting back to basics, to the basics that underlie the current position in which you'll now find yourself. Establish ground zero, seeking stability in relationship, relationship or in livelihood. The questioner seeks stability, strong foundations in their life or in their consciousness. This could manifest in the need to feel anchored in one place, seeking a home, or one who finds strength and stability in the place they inhabit. They need to re to establish firm foundations in relation to whatever you are building. Sorry, my reading wasn't- What made. year was this written or printed or published? I, I put it up online in 2010 and I Thank was working on it through the whole first decade of this century. Because to, um, come up with all the different archetypes I had to really meditate on it long and deep and um, also the actual system itself it's similar most similar to the I Ching but it is its own system because whereas the I Ching is the book of changes the oracle is about the change you know as uh, decay follows growth in this kind of cycle of changes in this particular cycle of 64 the, to the Dakinis or feminine wisdom principles stands as a kind of permanent standing way in a non-hierarchical circle of energy. So uh, it's a little bit different in its functionality and they're like, each of them are like the, the goddess building blocks of the new reality that we can establish where we use the real principle of um, female, spirituality, the return to the feminine, which is that bonding with the sacredness of all that is, so that we can stop using and abusing all the resources of our planet and all the other sentient beings as if they were non-sentient beings and start to see everything as sacred and reconnect the hoop and circle of life and the connection of the bridge between the material and the spiritual. Yeah. Anyone else want to have a spin?
So interestingly, as I've been working on my um, analog collages since I've been preparing for this, each of the ones I've been doing, they're all bringing me into relation with uh, parts of nature and the natural world. And it uh, feels like, you know, this is part of our, our body of who we are that has become so associated and needs to be rejoined. And a lot of what the Dakin is uh, all about too, it's about establishing those those links again and practices which get back into resonance with all all that is in, instead of thinking of ourselves as separate and we are all part of this divine dance of creation. It's so beautiful. Mm. Yeah, that really is like the essence of of kind of feminine wisdom, isn't it? You know, it's about yeah. Connection with with nature, with with Gaia, you know, right. that really is like the only way forward for humanity right now. Everything that's that's going on, um, it's kind of a matter of life and death for humanity and for a lot of the creatures on the planet too. So it yeah. is really the you know the most important thing. Yeah, for the pile for all of us to get back in tune with. I think. Yeah. I think that's why a lot of um because you know, different feminine archetypes become activated at different times and you notice that that happens in the collective unconscious um the microcosm and macrocosm there, there's been so much kali coming through in the last like like year and and to like on the run up to this year 2020 fire mm -hmm. plague you know and it is almost like you know the mother goddess is kind of saying okay no more no messing around anymore. I mean it, you've got to stop this. <laughs> and um, then to respect uh, the earth, because um, it kind of is the end of the line. So I'm finding that that, that archetype, the Kali archetype is, is really, really activated and just keeps, keeps coming up. And people tend to think of Kali as being destructive, but she's not, she's just great time and in great time, all that is born must die. You know, this is our whole cycle of, of, of life. So only a goddess with the size and compassion of her heart is able to absorb all those deaths as well as all those births. And through the other side of Kali's portal, through her, her blackness, her infinite blackness, her black hole in space is the, the birthing of the golden age. She is that portal to the, the re-emergence of the golden age. So um, mm. it's my, no means is she a, a destruction for the sake of it or anger for the sake of it. She's more like, you know, just sort of burning away all that which needs to be dissolved in order to um, find the true golden heart within that can you know, transcend and hold the energy beyond time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, she's she's cutting away everything that is not love, and it's it's a compassionate act because it, it releases us um, in freedom to to pure love. You know, it, it's just cutting away all all the root negativity um, that is rooted in the ego, and really broadens our, our perspective. So, it, yeah, she is divine compassion, definitely. So. Um, seems a little scary she's actually releasing us <laughs> <laughs> and she's the strength of our passions that we deny you know so that's a bit scary to a lot of people to right. be able to own that that level of passion but the only way you can really legitimately own it is when it's balanced with compassion so you have those that balance the two sides but of course i'm going to see that i'm a libra you know? <laughs> How long have you been in California? Please, Penny, if, I, if you don't mind me asking. Oh, to um, since '94. So perfect time now. Yeah, yeah. So I was in Northern California in the redwoods for 23 years in this magical place that um, Emma was describing, and now I'm in downtown LA. But 
in, in trying this to just uh, I enjoyed that whole wonderful sojourn there and then now uh, I've lived many lives really in this one life so this is just another chapter and I'm happy to embrace it. Cool. Yeah, that, that place is so beautiful, the, the, the goddess temple that um, your ex-husband, Christopher Hill, built kind of as a, a kind of temple for, for you and your work. And the, the energy there was just amazing. I, I believe you've done all kinds of like energy work and have people kind of come in. And yeah, it, it just felt utterly incredible. And you had that wizard power, which I, I think you called Christopher's power. Yeah. Presence, so it was really, I felt his presence was really in there. And um, I, actually, I was showing someone the other day because I worked a little bit um, on uh, the Magi's Grail in there. I'm very grateful to you for, for letting me spend some time in there and, and work on that piece a little bit. And um, the, this, this Magi's Grail painting is getting really, really activated recently in so many different different ways, which is about the sword and the grail. So I've been thinking about that wizard's tower quite, quite a lot recently. So it was very powerful an energy field and uh, when Christopher left his body this huge energy was there in this beautiful place and generally people don't really share those kind of spaces and I wanted to share it because I felt it was um, so beneficial not only for me but for anyone who could come there and he um, found the divine feminine later in his life he'd been the leader for many people and he built a place in honor of the divine feminine and then found me as that representative to, to hold that space. And so I took that responsibility very seriously and wanted to have this safe space for people to come and explore and open up. And um, it did serve that purpose for as long as we, we could do that. And also at the time now, there's much more awareness and much more work being done with the divine feminine. But at that time, there wasn't really very much. And so I wanted to create this template of making offerings to her and bringing her energy in and letting people experience that as a real tangible thing. And know that if we are, uh, if this is the age of the feminine, that it's not good enough for that just to be, you know, women. It has to be these higher frequencies, which are the divine feminine frequencies, the wisdom principles which the feminine can have. And I think that too is one of the reasons I'm very dedicated at this point to trying to have um, a platform in the world for myself as a woman of this age, so that our wisdom is not lost as it has been by society who sees women of a certain age, women who are older particularly, as not being relevant anymore. And we are so relevant and our wisdom is needed, especially if we're going to evolve and we need to evolve fast as a, a species right now. So um, I'm trying to deal with that next bastion of feminism, which is ageism and dealing with it head on as I generally do and using myself as a guinea pig and example to uh, try and prove that I, uh, I, we are relevant. Mm. Yeah, well done. I mean, they, yeah, it, it, in so many indigenous um, societies, you know, the grand, grandmother's uh, generation was deeply respected. The grandmother with wisdom, you know, like if you hold this spoke, you people listen. And it's just been completely reversed in modern society. With, with I mean, if, if you've been on this planet for a lot longer, then maybe you might have some kind of wisdom on the, on the matter. <laughs> you know? yes. so, and, and, um, yeah, so, yeah, well done. <laughs> Where did you grow up, please? Uh, I grew up in England and uh, went first to West Surrey College of Art, which is Barnum College of Art, and then to Chelsea in London. And um, then in the late 70s, I left from England and went to the States to work on this book, Sexual Secrets, and from there to the Caribbean, and then from there here. But most of my formative years were spent in um, England, South England, and then London.
There is a film that's come out uh, recently called Penny Singer Out of the Shadows, which is uh, filmmaker Richard Kovitz made, which kind of tracks my early life and work before I left from England because everybody thought I disappeared from the art world, which in fact I did because I, I moved and I started trying to get what I was doing coming out in books and to be able to be shared with a wider public. Um, but I certainly hadn't stopped creating or wanted to disappear, but in fact, um, I, I did disappear. And so I've been trying to kind of reclaim my spot over these last years. And uh, this, this film is about the early years before I, I left the movie. I'm so impressed that you um, you haven't lost your very British accent. Uh, <laughs> it's an old British accent, no, not the new British accent. They <laughs> <laughs> start sounding like them. I don't have no discipline. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you've been there since '94, and you still sound British. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> While we're all working, I could show some more of your work. You, you just mentioned the Caribbean, which I think is a really interesting chapter. And um, isn't that where you kind of disappeared to for uh, for a little while? Um, yes. Well, first, as I say, at the States, and then um, and then to the Caribbean. And when I was in the Caribbean, I had to make a choice: what do I do? Do I keep doing the work that I'm doing, which I can't really show? there on the island because they wouldn't understand it and it was very cutting edge and very sexually challenging and all those things so I, I couldn't do that and so I keep making that and send it back to New York and London and I had been very disappointed in the last reaction when I had a kind of retrospective in New York in 82 that people didn't seem to really understand what the work was about and all these men wanted to buy work and then ended up not buying it when I didn't go with the work. And uh, so <laughs> I just got pretty disillusioned. So I decided on plan B, which was to use my talents as a bridge with the local culture of the islands to try and bring some more cultural and artistic awareness there. I mean, art wasn't even taught in the school at that time. And so um, I decided on the latter and I made all these historical murals for the airport and then I embarked on what was my real calling there, which was to give face and form to the Arawak Indians, who were the indigenous people who had been there, and whose energy was still very much in the land, especially in such an undeveloped island as Anguilla, where I lived. And so I did over 100 paintings and pastels. And again, I started painting and drawing and doing those parts of my artistic practice that I hadn't been so much involved with for previous years. And um, that was what I realized was the reason that I was there to kind of pay homage to these and see how important the uh, indigenous view of life is. And I feel now how doubly relevant it is. These were a few other, another series I did, which I was there called Women and Water. And I was just trying to express what it felt like living in paradise to me, <laughs> living there, being in the kind of harmony I was with the elements was so divine. I felt I never, how would I ever leave? But life presented the opportunity to change and I came back to, uh, back to the States, but I just wanted to try and show through the imagery just how amazing it felt to blend with nature in the way that we could in such a beautiful, beautiful divine environment of sun and sea and the blessings of that was just uh, such an amazing chapter. Mm -hmm. Really good place to disappear to. If you're going to disappear in the art world, disappear to the that that looks like a very beautiful and restful and fulfilling that was beautiful. And then I had really like a, a mini career within the, the arc of my whole career as an artist. It was like a little inset of different kind of work because I had different criteria. I was trying to produce work that could be accessible and 
uh, especially with the whole arrow actually is assimilatable by anyone who would not just in the fine art world. And so I try to create that, that language um, that would be readable in that way. I mean, there's so much work right now um, coming to the forefront at last that pe people are doing with Indigenous people and honouring Indigenous wisdom. And, and that uh, one, for instance, has feathers woven into the canvas. So some of these feathers are painted okay. and brown are actual feathers that I collected from a Macaw who lived there. <laughs> and uh, that's all woven into the canvas so that we have the collage elements always coming in and the surrealism being part of how I would create even when I was doing a more traditional form of painting or drawing. Yeah. This one again has, she is actually cut out a wooden bit uh, out of wood and then painted and she has real gold on her. And then there's an actual life cast with this frog uh, totem around her neck. And then these are actual slices of real bamboo in front of her. So the painting has dimension as um, well as just being a painting. Weaving in kind of like actual real, um, real things in, into your painting. I know my Bridget painting. Is, Sorry, um, I got to go. Lovely to hear you. You're really interesting. I'll put up my stuff tomorrow on the um, page. All right, take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay. No time to share. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Freddie. Oh, In fact, you know, it's kind of it's gone seven. But do we want to start like sharing what what we've done? Take yes, it. let's see what anyone has done. I know it's hard to get something complete in, the, in this time, but I certainly would love to see anyone process because it's in the sharing is where we've managed to get the feedback and the interaction and the, the mind opening that can happen from that. So I'd love to see what anyone has that they're willing to share, even incomplete. All right. <laughs> I love the clothes pegs. Are those real or collage or um, uh, paper, the clothes pegs? It's, it's kind of 3D. Yeah, they're real. Yeah, right. That looks great. <laughs> it's a mix of like recycled things and things that you find in the countryside. You want to talk about it? Tell me things about the different elements. Uh, well, look, you've got like a mask, a mask right. tangled up, tangled right. up in the, in the leaves. Yes. Uh, there's, some there's some chestnuts there. I got those yes. this morning. I got those <laughs> in the mountains. Um, that's some tzatziki that I ate about three days ago. That's the recycling. That's like a, a packet. Oh, look, there's some, more, there's some more food in there as well. There's some food. I like food. I put some more food in there. <laughs> we need it in this time too when we've been having to hoard it. Uh, <laughs> and then I like I cut out my I cut out my face from that photo there. Oh the photos. Oh, so the photos are basically two pictures of me that are quite commonly used on social media and stuff like that. Oh, um, good. And I don't take a lot of photographs of myself. I don't take a lot of photographs generally. Um but, um, but anyway, there are two photos of me, but they don't really represent very much about me, I don't think. So on the photograph over here, I cut out my face and I put my face over there. Right. Uh, sort of. And that's gaffer tape. That's gaffer tape there. There's some more gaffer tape somewhere else. <laughs> in the, thing. the gaffer tape represents the sun. Uh, I'm watching the sun. So this is me in the countryside watching a nice sort of countryside scene with the recycled masks representing the sky. <laughs> nice, nice. What are you in your glasses there? Oh, those are, um, there's a bit more gaff tape there. Um, I've got green eyes, but the, the, photograph right. of, the photograph of me, I was shining a projector on my face and I just brought this projector and it shined on my face and I just took a photograph of it. And then that ended up, but like, can you see I'm really red? Yes. 
Yeah, so I wanted to represent the fact that I've got green eyes. So I got those peas out of the freezer uh, a couple oh, of minutes right. ago. Oh, brilliant. I love um, that. So... <laughs> <laughs> right. You're like little planets in your eyes. They're great. <laughs> I'm not sure that, I don't think I want my neighbours to see this. <laughs> <laughs> they know that I live on my own. <laughs> <laughs> and what's this here under your myself. chin? It looks like uh, the silver. It's, it's a dessert. This. Yes. It's a dessert. It's a tocino, oh. de, tocino de cielo, it's, which Hooray. is another thing. That I, it's recycling uh, from, right, my, right. from my waste bin. Because right, I didn't have like, magazines or anything. Uh, Excellent. <laughs> uh, I like really it. Fun talking about it, but I think I'm done talking about it now. Good. I love it. I love all the, the combination of the the different levels of the three-dimensional, the flat and everything. Very nicely done. Good. Yeah. Um, Good. Thank you very much. I, um, I'll just say thank you so much for um, encouraging the creativity. It's so interesting to hear you speak and, and all the questions and everything. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you. Good. And I like your piece. Has anyone else got anything done enough to share? Yeah. Um, well, I've just done um, a two second piece. It's, it's really fast, but you know, just already just because um, I was late to the workshop. Anyway, it's just a rubbish piece. Really. Well, it's not rubbish, but you know, um, basically uh, from the yin, I just, it's very simple. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so there's a lotus growing out of my head and then there's the blue water triangle. Um, and then I just, it basically is the background and I did cut out the green hairdo. Right, 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 that's very nice. Yeah, like the palette. it's very, very pretty. Tall. What was that? I like the palette of it. It's really pretty with the blue and the pink and the green. It's very nice. And uh, the fact that you're looking down over the whole thing, which is great. Is this your sense of um, floating as in an overview of, of what's going on? It's, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just was enjoying to cut up paper and get this glue out and do a bit of collage, but actually, you know, I was thinking, oh, maybe I don't do it because I was late and I, you know, I had to grab all the stuff. But actually even doing it for like five, ten minutes is really relaxing and lovely, isn't it? So you just see how it kind of opens yeah. up and keeps unraveling. So I do I like it. It's one of the best ways to open up one's imagination and also just sort of tune into one's natural knowledge of what works you know of what proportion is what composition is it's just a way of just getting access to it directly without in a kind of intellectual way and that satisfaction of feeling when something feels right it's just uh, it's your own knowing and for mm -hmm. me that i get a good feeling from the balance of the colors and the fact that you're looking down and all of it is it's very nice Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming and doing the talk, Penny. It's been really great. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank really. you for having me. And um, I love the daikini. Oh, thanks. Yes, I love them too. <laughs> Anyone else got anything? Yeah, I've got, I've got a color to share. I'm just literally putting putting something on it right now. Okay, so um, I decided to work completely intuitively and I literally have turned my brain off for once um, and just kind of like let it all kind of like flow. Oh, I literally cool. just opened uh, a magazine and randomly, a bit like you would pick like a bikini, randomly right. images, um, and put them together and of course wait, when I do it always, always ends up being... I just oh, auto-corrected yes. the colour. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's very nice. Is yeah. this from your painting at the bottom? Is this from yeah, your I mean, I, Yeah, I, I didn't have a, like a picture um, to hand of me, 
but I thought, you know, all of my paintings are pretty much me. Although this <laughs> reflection of there's an album cover for Millie Moonstone, I've always found that um, it's I, painting that portrait of her was like painting an aspect of me, which is is the songwriter aspect and the musician aspect that um, that I kind of have going on in the background, and I, I really love to make music, but. So I'm really fond of that image. Um, so I thought that that could be the the reflection. But the, yeah, one of the first things that I kind of opened the magazine, there's this very powerful, almost ISIS looking woman. I, I don't know if you can see that that's actually a very right. deep blue that she's wearing. Right, um, right, right. Yeah. I looked at it and I thought, oh, that's ISIS. And then uh, the next moment I flicked open and I saw this seal and this crown or ring. And I'm thinking right. a lot about seals at the moment and um yeah it, it, it just seems to be a kind of like subliminal theme so the crown went up and the seal went there and th and then I, I opened it up and saw this leopard so it has to kind of like go go around somehow and then this this shape is a little bit like my crown shape it's a um it's a you know the kind of ultimate feminine portal shape um, right, right. Blue shoes. <laughs> I'm not sure what the blue shoes. What's he, what's he representing up here? Um, I don't know. I opened the page and suddenly there's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Jesus has got to be in there. Um, you know, like, okay. like enough, masculine. Like, where would the divine feminine be without the divine masculine? Right. Think. So he's your yeah masculine side there. <laughs> <laughs> And then seconds before I showed this, I suddenly opened it up and saw saw this eye and um, a big blue eye. I've got really blue eyes. So yes. Um, yes. That's your, your all seeing eye there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, and the mouth, I was thinking of your like mouth series and hands. Hands are so hands are so symbolic in paintings. They they can carry right. just emotion and energy. On the pearls right. um, from the portal at the front, I'm painting. Aphrodite in the background. It's all about the pearl. It's all about the divine mm -hmm. pearl of wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the pearls had to go in. <laughs> Very nice. I yes, no, you see, there's a story. This is yeah. it's wonderful that almost self-articulates, right? Once you just let yourself choose the pieces and they can come together and then when they're there, you say, oh yes, that's saying that. And that's what I love about the freedom of this kind of color technique. Mm, yeah, it's it's good, especially for me to like free up and allow the intuitive process to take over and to kind of like trust it. Right. And, you know, without actually knowing what it means, you find that all the symbols just like fall into place like in intuitive. Exactly. And then you realize what it means later. It's, it's a bit like when I was with Carly, I was doing a lot of ancestor stuff to release my grandfather who, who died in a submarine accident. And I only realized like a week before I did the ritual, that if I turn it on its side, it's a submarine. So ah. it was, <laughs> and it's kind of like, that's a clear, just a clear example of how powerful and intelligent the subconscious mm -hmm. and 90% of our mind that we don't access is. Exactly. So I can just let it out the box. Exactly. Happens, should we should we maybe just do right young right back the TV on? Who's that? <laughs> Turn the TV should, on. Should we Is maybe just else? Maybe share two more and then should we yes, wrap up please. and just sort of conscious of time? So, and, yes, and yes, more? please. I have something and but I I totally engage digitally, which means yeah, because I was not um, ready to go, but then I thought like, you know, I have so much material. I can just kind of put it together and collage it in this way. Now, I hope that you can see it from me showing this. Let me see. Am, am I holding it visible for you? Yes, 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 yes. I can I'm see. diagonal. I'm showing it diagonal, so it's a little bit more visible. Right, right. Oh, I think some of the, the upper squares are not so clear, but um, I can see all the, the lower two rows. Let me see. Um, I don't know how to share it properly. Maybe pull it a little bit further away from the screen, Ingrid. And, like and this? Tilt it a little bit. It's just, I think it's the light that's catching on it on the screen. 
Oh, uh, okay, wait. Right, they're just wiping out the, the top yeah. part a little bit. But, but talk, talk about it to us so that we can explore with, with you. Okay, um, yeah. well, what I've been doing is uh, I've been uh, just uh, uh, digging through my archive of photographs from the sky, from roots, from the uh, trees, and uh, then a sort of multiplicity of uh, whatever I did, like, uh, for example, this one you can see very well. I I pulled yes. up, the, you know, like a really like a Mahakala kind of. Uh, so um, I've been just uh, playing with this a little bit and uh, putting it together in a form of nine tiles. While one of the tiles is a uh, uh, six, so I have six and nine, which is 15, and I'm born on the 15th. So I'm putting symbolism and a little bit in a different way together. Mm -hmm. And my hair going down is like the roots of the trees while I'm also having a picture of the sky because I'm very much at the moment focusing on things from the sky. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm basically, I'm making a whole series all year of trees and skies and clouds and um yeah mm -hmm. what else can i say right. not so right. much mostly right. i'm no, just showing great. things and that's it <laughs> yes no no this is great <laughs> 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 very nice very and nice. then yeah mostly i don't know whether you do have that um, um also when you're creating something at that moment when it comes out it's not like you have language for it Right, right, right. Because otherwise, if I would be able to put it in words, I wouldn't even bother to create something visually. Exactly, exactly. But I sometimes find the words, especially if they're not just like the explaining away kind of words, but, you know, poetic language can often just help to give keys into the, the landscape of that visual world that you've created. But as you say, if we could tell it in words, we would bother to make images of it but it's that <laughs> beyond words but then the words can help kind of just you know give context and um hopefully in a in a more expansive and creative way rather than a an explanation kind of way oh absolutely absolutely right, uh, so. i do need a little bit of distance from the moment when i've been creating right. something and then you just kind of leave it's nearly like it has yeah. to air a little bit or you know, some things they have to, when you cook, you have to put it a little bit in the, in the fridge it. and then you take it out again and then it's kind of well done or ready to go. Yeah, yeah. and then it tells you what it needs to tell you because as I was saying earlier, it's always, it's a biofeedback loop. It's not a one-way flow. These creations have a life of their own and they teachers as much as we're putting what we can into them, so. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. You. It's so lovely to see you again. Ah, uh, yes. Nice to see you too. <laughs> Can I show one? Is it? Is there enough time? Yes. I yep. Go for it. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Okay. Here's a little one. Ooh. Oh. That's um, nice. Oh. Oh, man. Yeah. That's sort of stepping out of a portal or something. Um, and then this one I've been doing while we've been talking, it's more based on the sort of green man. Ah, yes. Sort of oh, very nice. So that's, see, that's, a, that's a, a representation of me, although right. I don't have a but I'm looking out of the green in up here to the stars. Yes. Uh, and there's a couple of peacock feathers in that. Not really sure what it means. When I do my collages, I often put them online and ask people what they mean to do the seership. It's it's it's, it's right. be close to it to be able to work out. And I get these amazing kind of like tarot-esque readings from other people about what that, what it means symbolically. I really like that. Well, I, I love that because I like the way that your soul in relation to all this amazing world of nature and then the connection of looking up to, to the stars, it, it tells a story for sure, which oh, is cool. very beautiful. <laughs> 
Well, thank, thank you, Jenny, again from, uh, you know, me and everyone else here. It's been amazing. Great, great. Yeah. Get I'm going to try and show you. I don't know if I can lift up the computer to show you what I've been working on while we've been talking. Um, I can't lift it because I haven't. Are you able to sort of try and see this? I'm getting some help here just to see if we can show it. Oh, there we go. Okay, time screen too. And I haven't stuck it yet, so I couldn't uh, I couldn't lift it. But there we are. Yeah, good enough. Okay, thank you. So we were both in a green vein there. And uh, yeah. they always give a bad name to, you know, lizard people or something in the uh, extraterrestrial. So I've made this um, chameleon be half of me here and blending with him. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. What were, were those paintings you're cutting up there, or prints, or? Um, just part of my um, collage collection, which oh. literally I have from the 1970s. So these are all old photos from magazines and things that I had then, and it's my kind of bank of collage images. And then I just sift through and um, selected some and cut some out in these days leading up to doing this, and then. As we were sitting talking, this is what, what came together. Mm. Great. Great. Really great. And thanks uh, to Jed and Emma for setting this up with Giles as well. Amazing work, everyone. And thank you, Jenny, once again. What an amazing workshop. Really inspiring. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Emma. Emma. Thanks, Emma. Much Good appreciated. Thank thanks, you. Jed. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. See thanks. everyone. Thanks, Emma. Bye. Now we finished on like seven twenty-three. Just had to like throw the twenty-three. And then <laughs> <everyone> in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 It's too late to share mine. Yeah. No, do you have one to show? I want it. I heard yeah. that. I wanted to see it. Uh, well, I just said, I've only got one copy of this picture, so I didn't want to stick stuff on it. So Wait. I don't know if I could share the screen. Oh, yeah. Can I share the screen? Yeah. Uh, oh, host disabled attendee screen share. I can see you. I can see yeah, you. Yeah, you can see me, but I don't think you can see the. You should oh. I, I can't share the screen. Big green button down the bottom. Hobby yeah, I try that, but then it's oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, now you can do it because she just made you co-host. That one. There you go. Ooh. Oh, there we are. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh, anyway, my so goodness. So they're just they're just laid down. So, um, bit restricted by what magazines I had to cut stuff out of. But if I was to try and rationalise it, I suppose I could say the sort of lizard brain and glamour versus <laughs> a sort of more natural <laughs> thoughts coming out there and um slightly i don't know wickerish <laughs> it's really nice i like it oh, and i'm so anyway. glad you, i'm so glad you shared it because you know with seeing yours and the one before and mine it it we talk about sharing of dreams and things but here we are in a conscious so-called reality and yeah look, uh, symbiosis is between the imagery that we have you know i've got my chameleon you've got your lizard you've got the name and the branches i have it in all the leaves around we're we're all kind of connected aren't we <laughs> yeah i love i loved what you were saying earlier penny quite yeah. sadly my my computer just crashed i didn't have it plugged in but um yeah a lot of a, a lot of, a lot of wisdom and um a lot of um yeah just 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 fabulous to hear you talking Oh, thank you. So and thanks I really very like much. This piece, it's got a, <laughs> a, a fabulous yeah. look to it. And as I say, I love the, the synchronicity of how we've all sort of joined in this. In this yeah. Room. Yeah. Thank yeah. Particularly okay. with this whole COVID thing, it's been really, um, really valuable experience. Anyway, so thanks very much. Thank you. Algae, Algaia, Algaia woman as well. That was very green, wasn't it? Yes. 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 Nature, a nature theme going on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, just got to love this planet. Oh, yeah. Anyway, does anyone else yeah. have anything to say before we get out of here? Jen, did you share anything? Uh, you know, I, don't know. I, just, 
I'm not going to do it. Oh. <laughs> wow, you're going big. Well, you do. Oh, wow. Oh, oh that's amazing. fantastic. Oh, that's great. Oh, I love this mouth on the on the body here. That's really hot. Oh, yeah, you'd like that. That's for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. And the mask, everything. Oh, that's a good size too. Yeah, look at that. Fabulous. Thank you. Thanks for that's the interview. Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. That's a very nice piece. <laughs> Are you finished or are you more to go on there? The more to go, yeah. No, I think so. Well, if, if everyone can follow up somehow after, I don't know if we can keep the connective tissue, so to speak, so that I can see how this one finishes and see the other one that I couldn't see before. Um, Jules and Emma, I don't know if you can facilitate with that, but I'd, I'd love, to, love to keep connected and see it. Yeah, we could post them all in the event page or something, couldn't we? Good. So, yeah, that would be work. really good. Let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, thanks for the opportunity, everyone. Thanks for doing a great job. Thanks. Thank you very much. Penny, yeah. is there a possibility to see your movie? Uh, yes, it's on paper, I think. Um, I can send. Um, the links, I can't remember which platforms it's on in the UK, but it is, it's available. In, are you in the UK? No, I'm in the Netherlands. Ah, so I don't know where it's going there, though it's up on Blu-ray, and you can buy a copy on Blu-ray. Um, I can uh, send some details somewhere for uh, for um, Jules and Emma, and maybe they can put it up in a place where you can access as well. Um, oh, that would be lovely. Me, I'm on Instagram, just Penny Slinger on Instagram. So do send me a direct message. I'll um, send you the information. You Thank you so much. I will. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Is there any, anyone else? Now, we'll forever hold your peace. <laughs> anyone? <laughs> I don't know. I, I equally have done. Sorry, coming late. Um, I did something digital, so I don't know if it's going to work out and you can be able to see it or not. It's always the way. Tommy's doing the with these things. Right. I can't see it. And you can't see it. Now it's going to I can. Free. I can see. I can see. Um, That's your cat. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are you going to make of this? Um, great, great, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's, it says me and then. I don't ah. know. I said to my oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, I love it. I, just, I love what you've done with the mouth there. That's fabulous. <laughs> it's sort of me climbing out of my mouth or something. And then yes. my eyes are television. But I was letting my brain just do its own thing, really, rather than that's just great. doing it conscious or at all. It was kind of all subconscious. It's uh, great. Uh, and so probably people will be able to read in more into it. But I don't know. I just did. Just, just trying something completely different and also just something different on using the iPad. Um, and again, cutting cutting out and, and not knowing necessarily what I was gonna choose as the image and where it was gonna go. So kind of trying to use the analog analog formula, but literally just trying to use it as kind of right. subconsciously um, and then doing it doing it digitally. But uh, yeah, so good. yeah, it's just trying to do something a bit different. Um, I don't know. It's, uh, you know, it's it's me. I've got. This, I, I always have this dual personality. Not dual personality necessarily, but it's, you know, I have two lives. One which is my sort of life as a sort of you know, how I am, how I, what I have to be like for work and stuff like that, <laughs> and then how how I how I am inside. And so I'm right. consciously like an actor, I suppose. Mm. And so, um, but the real me is always trying to fight to get out. Um, I feel it. I see that. It's great. Something I really like, like it. It's very strong. I, oh, I think it's you. wonderful, very successful. Image. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Bonnie. Yes, oh, well, I hope everyone will put them up on the uh, on the page because I'd like to be able to have a chance to look at them more. And I, I really like that piece. It spoke to Thank me very strongly. Yeah. So, Thanks, Bonnie. No, it's great, yeah. great, great to see what you've done and what you do. It's wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you. Good. <laughs> so, um, have you got something, Georgina? Um, well, yeah. I mean, it, it's funny. It's just this this picture that I um that I 
it was one of my favorite pictures of me like when I was like 20 something but it was just before I started on my road of being manic depressive so there's this kind of like there's this dichotomy of it being this kind of image of me where everything seems to be all right but then there's all these kind of like black holes and I just sort of I don't know it was just like it was things were you know it's a strange time I, I'd just been sailing from Southampton to Portugal and I was in Portugal so this is like a period I don't know it's just just I don't know it, it was a strange time in my life Wow, it, it, it feels very, very tender somehow. I, I felt very emotional looking at it. I, <laughs> oh, wow. thank it, you. It's, it's in there, but I can feel it a lot. And it's a lovely photo of you too, and just the juxtaposition of things. It's yeah, it has a lot yeah. of yeah. I, I really like it. Yeah, it's just. I just chose it because it's one of my favorite pictures of me, and it's like, and then yeah just this sort of supernatural and that is all it's like uh, I just wanted just to put black holes all over it I don't know why but it was just like um and the desert I, just, I don't know just like um the dichotomy between what I looked like and how I felt I think that was the weird thing it's like right, I looked right. really nice but I just felt like shit and it was just like it was just a right. point in my life so uh, that, that's I mean that I think is definitely the you lost the purpose of the exercise here, turning the inside out like that to show that that's the surface of what's going on inside. And yeah, yeah, beautiful. Mm. Very, very tender. I, I like it a lot. Mm. I was just thinking about your your subliminal choice of word there, Penny, like the exercises and thinking about the word exercise and, and the right. nature of the act of getting this stuff out is in itself very healing and cathartic. You know, you can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just knowing too that um, if you do it with, you know, really do it properly, then that healing is something that's not just for your own healing, but it can represent a collective healing too in the way that we are all connected. And also that, you know, when others see that you also have your own dark nights of the soul but got through it, then it's very comforting and it can really help. So it's not just for yourself that you do this kind of self mm. healing, but it's for the collective as well. And that's always I think, very inspiring to take one out of one's own personal box and know that we're all connected in this. And I think there's been enough in this little exercise that we did today to show how connected we all are. We look at the images, which I hope we would get the chance to review afterwards. And, um, just let it seep in and realize that there's a lot going on. Yeah. A lot of things to the surface and it is a collective experience for each one, ultra personally, but collectively as well. So really appreciate this joining together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been it's been so lovely to sh to share with you, and yeah, yeah, it is like I, I find this a lot. Like um, when you bring any kind of like collective together, there, there's archetypal themes, and people take on different archetypes in the entire group. We found that on the pilgrimage, and we Jen, and it's like um, but you you do realize that although you're working from your perspective, you realize that you're actually all working for the greater good, and kind of like healing each other in a giant kind of collective right. experiment. Right. <laughs> but it's, been really lovely to do this with everyone um I'm yeah. thinking, i think marianne needs to go um are, are we ready to yeah. wrap up now it's, um anyone got anything burning that they need to share before we you guys can carry on i'm gonna go and have my dinner now okay all right, right. No, we're probably time to sign off <laughs> <laughs> if our technical support is going we will <laughs> you'll be absolutely fine <laughs> thank you so much Thank yeah, it's been, been wonderful. Thank uh, yeah. like second that. Thanks very much, Penny. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Very, Thank you. very yeah. precious. Yeah. See you. Very okay. precious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Inspiring. Thank you. Everybody. Have a great solstice, everybody. Yes, happy solstice. It's so special. Yeah. Bye. 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 <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Can you help me sign off here? <laughs> <laughs>
Hi, I haven't seen you for years. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are still a team. Penny, thank you so much. That was amazing. <laughs>